It's October 10th, 2022. This is a special edition of Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 205 of Rook and another special edition of our program. This one entitled, The Uprising, It's Not a Protest, It's a Revolution. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hope you're okay wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto. Salam Dustanazi. Sturur Bashama. It's not a protest. It's a revolution. Maybe now it's time to change the terminology. It's time to call it as it is. It's time to give those on the ground in our homeland their due that this is not a simple set of demonstrations by an activist few. This is not a protest. It's the beginnings of revolution. It's the signal being sent from a new generation on the streets in Iran that they refuse to be afraid anymore. When the workers are on side and the strikes begin, it's not a protest. It's a revolution. When the military departures occur and the defections set in, it's not a protest, it's a revolution. When the sounds of various classes, ages, and ethnicities unite in a collective cry, it's no longer a protest, it's a revolution. When young girls and boys are literally willing to die, it's not a protest, it's a revolution. If the first couple of weeks after the killing of Massa Amini were colored by the question, is this an inflection point for Iran? Perhaps we now have our answer. There's no stopping what has become a people's social and cultural movement led by youth with verve, determination and fortitude, amplifying a growing rage that has been bubbling for over four decades, rage emanating from a historically rich culture stuck in an Islamic Republic cage. Yes, it's finally different. This is not a protest. It's a revolution. And the results will not be immediate. It may take weeks, months, or more, and the violent repression is brutal, and it will get worse. And we will continue to hear stories and witness videos that punch us in the gut. Images of young people dying or being arrested and beaten and taken away simply for asserting their desire for basic human rights. Stories like that of the sister of a dear friend who was shot in her car on the weekend in Tehran simply for being near other cars that were blaring their horns. But if the crackdowns were effective before, they are seemingly effective no more. There is no stopping the will of a people led by young hearts and minds who have pledged to not give in. There is no stopping the will of a people who will continue until they win. This is not a protest. It's the beginnings of a revolution. They have run out of space in their torturous prisons. It's so extreme. They cannot contain the number of those fighting against this regime. We've once again assembled voices from the diaspora to give us their perspectives on the current situation. This time, Shaparak Shajerizadeh in Toronto, Nikohang Kosar in Washington, Mojgan Marafizadeh in the Rook Studio, Kimia Yousefi in London, and the debut of a special new musical piece by Dang Show Live. This is a special edition of Rook, episode 205, The Uprising. Not a protest, it's a revolution. We're here in the Rook studio, uh, our on-air team that have been, uh, we've been together throughout these uh, episodes about the uprising. Smart Pega is here. Hi. Hello. And Groovy Shia. Hello. Hi. Yes, yes. I debated about this so, uh, opening essay, as you guys know, about whether to call this the beginnings of a revolution or not. But the last week really convinced me. This weekend really convinced me. I mean, um, we've seen the effects of internet blockage and brutal crackdowns before Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it ain't having an effect this time you know echoing in my mind are the voices of those young people in iran that we heard from on thursday's show saying i'm not giving up we're not giving up this is a it's a new generation it's a new mentality and there's just no quitting and between that and different events happening uh you know the 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 amount of energy on saturday or across mm-hmm. iran mm-hmm. that was being expended on on the, the regime can't seem to keep up with what's going on i mean uh 
uh, and of course the solidarity around the world um, that seems to be growing it um, it certainly this time is definitely different very different I think one of the biggest things and um, one of the things I was reading about actually is something that's really helped this revolution to be um, is that uh, you know these individuals are gathering in a disorganized manner and that's actually helping significantly because what you're saying about you know the regime not being able to keep up that's part of it is because you know they'll pop up in one place and then they'll disappear and then pop up in another and then again and they know exactly what I mean that's two of the three people we had on yes. the show on, on mm-hmm. Thursday both Luna and we called her Luna she's got a different name <laughs> but that her pseudonym Luna and Mustafa both said that's exactly the point that's, that's right. what we're doing yes. we don't want leadership because we're we're faking them out by mm-hmm. turning up in places that they don't I mean that said you know it, we got to say this up front in case any sort of talk of this is a revolution or something would be mistaken for um, some sort of celebratory energy I mean this is there's devastating shit happening right now there's right. just uh, as every Iranian near a smartphone you know near their iPhone has uh, knows at this stage you know it's doom scrolling through mm-hmm. videos and reports of horrible things happening as I just mentioned in that essay and you know we heard just a few hours ago we're we're, we're recording this on um Monday early evening here, mm-hmm. uh, October tenth, and we we heard just a few hours ago about a seven year old kid, yeah, in amongst yeah. the many in Kurdistan yeah. who are uh, being killed, and and you know the image of that guy who was shot, oh my you goodness. know, uh, for, for for honking his horn, in his car, yeah. yeah. I uh, mean, could you imagine to be anywhere in the world, sitting in your car, regardless of what is going on around you, for you to be an innocent bystander and to have that happen? Well, and I've got to say, well, he he honked his horn, which is mm-hmm. fair, uh, but I mean, really, you know, insane that he would get, you know, that there anybody would take umbrage exactly. at that, let alone be, shoot you. But but I mentioned in the essay a story, mm-hmm. and and this is a a close friend of mine's sister uh, had gone out for uh, I don't even want to get a lot of details about it, but they but they'd basically gone out with the, the family and uh, just to get some gas on the way somewhere. Um, hadn't been in the car that long stopped somewhere where there's a few cars a couple of the other cars honk Mm -hmm. not that this this family is you know anti-regime but they but they they weren't even honking Mm -hmm. and the Basij come and break the windows and shoot her with a pellet gun in the face so much so that she gets taken to hospital her face is deformed etc bloodied and then and for those of us who you know, grew up in the West and don't even can't conceive of these things. I mean, they're, it's also horrific. I mean, the the doctor stitches her up and then says, um, says, you, you know, you better get out of here quickly. Let's here's a way out through the back because oh. because the authorities are going to come get them. Yeah. You know, they they come and round up the injured, right? Uh, to I mean, the, you know, it's so dark mm-hmm. and macabre, and at the same time. You know, as we've been talking about this, these these contradictory feelings we've been having for three weeks, and everyone knows what we're talking about, especially if you're uh, of Iranian background. Right? At the same time, there's this exhilaration, mm-hmm. right? Wow, look at the bravery. Look at what's happening. And being on this protest on, on the weekend here in Toronto, the the bigger one that went, went down to downtown core, and everybody singing along to Shervin's song or saying Masa Amini's name as we walked by the hockey arena mm-hmm. with people in Toronto Maple Leaf shirts going, what, what's <laughs> happening here? You know, it was, it was empowering, you know, it was empowering to think, well, how in our little way, maybe we can help to continue the energy for mm-hmm. those people on the front lines in Iran doing all the real work, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, all these uh, stories that uh, one of them, like you just said, and on the social media, you've seen it like, as you said, it's like punching our gut, you know, and every second we we confront a new story and we we have to, I mean, this is, I think, um, I'm, so, I'm telling for myself, we have to uh, take care of our mental mm-hmm. health in these yeah. days, you know, because uh, it's like devastating. Yeah, devastating. I've been trying to tell uh, our, our team members too, like take a break from the phone for yeah. half an hour, an hour, mm-hmm. because uh, also I don't know about you guys, but you know, you take it to bed and the first so the, the worst. Uh, you fall asleep with images of what's happening in Iran. You wake up with images of what's happening in Iran, yeah. and it's and I start thinking about my family there mm-hmm. and going you know like what's happening yeah. to my cousins my aunts you know my uncles yeah. whatever you know it's very very 
Yeah, that uh, contradictory uh, feeling that you were saying, though, with, you know, feeling um, exhilarated, but then also, I mean, obviously the turmoil that this these images and these mm. stories and things like that have on us. Um, I was reading an article in The New Yorker, and um, they had quoted that the average age of protesters is 15. And I mean, I was just... Really? Forward. Yeah. That even seems. I mean, I don't know. If that seems a bit extreme, but that th- they, and that's what I thought. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm quoting this article yeah, here, I so know. I don't know if. But if we know a lot of them are teenagers. Exactly. We I mean, do you know that. But I mean, at the minute I read that line, it was, <clears throat> you know, it was this sense of pride that you know, I mean, they're kids. Kids yeah. as young as 15 are. But out you there. know what? That that's the thing. I mean, uh, um, I was with a group of folks on uh, after the protest on sa- Saturday night, and some, you know. Um, prominent Toronto Iranians and and to to a person they were they just said we owe such a debt mm-hmm. to these because to these kids who are these maybe not we don't want them out there for twelve or something yeah. but you know to those in their late teens and their twenties who are uh, you know that that feeling of exhilaration is a catharsis mm-hmm. it's a catharsis of forty three years of of having this twist not in your stomach mm-hmm. and then actually seeing some people out there trying to do something about this and going oh my god thank you and how proud are we of you and how proud are we of the global Iranian community mm-hmm. coming together at this moment you know united for now more or less but mm-hmm. uh, um, I should mention that really it's a really strong show um, that we've got coming up we've actually got some amazing people coming into the Rook studio um, Shaparek Shajari Zadeh um, if you recognize that name, she's a women's rights activist who's now here in Canada, but she's here, here in exile. She was one of the um, folks in Iran who, uh, one of the, the strong women who started uh, Girls of Revolution Street and White Wednesdays. Mm-hmm. She was burning her head job, you know, before this this period, and um, uh, and so it's very very uh, great to have her coming in to to you know. Give us her thoughts and wisdom right now. Nico Henko Sar, the journalist and blogger and cartoonist, is going to join us again. He's in D.C. Mojgan Mwarafizadeh, she's a refugee advocate who has spent the last 10 years or so in Indonesia hmm. in exile there. You know, one of those things where she went there and the promise of going to Australia and then got caught mm. in re- with refugee with limited status in in Indonesia has now made it to Canada she in the meantime organized a um, has got this refugee advocacy organization and she'll give us her perspective on that and what she calls you know she came to Canada went to that big protest we had here in Toronto mm-hmm. last week with mm-hmm. the 50,000 mm-hmm. and said that that's the first time she's felt really free Wow. In, wow. in her life to be able to go out and, and express herself. Um, Kimia Yousefi, who is in London, we've had her on the show before, um, a woman with a law degree, but also a social media influencer who uh, uh, has been very active talking about what's going on. So she'll join us from London. And then Dang Show, yes. your brother Taha is coming, yes. and you guys are going to perform. Now, we I should explain that we for a while had the idea that we were going to do a full show yes. dang show i've i've had my aspiration has <laughs> been to do the lifetime interview with dang show how you guys started the yes. ups and downs yeah. the coming to you know transplanting yourself to north america that's not obviously possible or appropriate at this time but um, the fact that you guys are here and you're going to play a song that's, I guess, yes, a tribute going, to the... Yeah, actually, we are going to debut a song that, yeah, it's a tribute to, like, these events. And I have to say that we uh, we are, we are have a show coming, like, in two weeks, and all the songs that we are going to perform there is, like, uh, some kind of revolutionary songs that we are going wow. to perform there. And, yeah. Well, it's great that you guys are doing that in the studio. I can't wait to hear the song, and... Yeah honored to have you guys uh, debuting it here um, you know some of the some of what we've been feeling in terms of the wow it's different this time or or this thing is picking up rather than dying down the beginnings of of strikes mm-hmm. um, the, the mm-hmm. some oil workers yeah you know, it, it's unprecedented actually in terms of scale and unity um, there's been walkouts from um, oil and petrochemical workers, I believe, and I mean that that in and of itself is is huge. Huge, but it's also historically significant um, because it's it was a pivotal move um, during the 1979 revolution as well. Yeah, it was yeah. kind of the straw that broke the camel's yeah, back, so to speak, yeah. when that took place. So yeah. for us to see that happen now is is huge. 
It's huge. Yes. I mean, no one can sort of underestimate uh, how how big a deal that is. Mm-hmm. That's that's no random sector either. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. If the I mean, if that were to become more widespread, uh, ag- again, back to Dr. Borgerdi uh, last week or a couple yes. weeks ago, listing mm-hmm. the things that have to happen for this to be a more traditional kind of revolution. That was one of them. Widespread yeah. strikes. Uh, so if we're seeing the beginnings of that, the other thing he said was defections from the from the police or military where mm-hmm. um, people are just sort of giving up on you. Know. Now, we haven't seen that widespread, but we began to see some videos this weekend that were really shocking, you mm-hmm. know, to see like people in, uh, I don't know what those outfits are. They were the, the, the official, not the thugs, but the, yeah. the ones who are kind of police uh, uh, uniform walking alongside protesters. Um, yeah, gone visual, you know, I, I think you mean like... You I can't know. keep track of all the different <laughs> yeah, too. suppressive too, yeah. uh, organizations, but yeah, the ones walking alongside were, mm. were uh, there was quite a statement, I, I, I feel, that was being mm-hmm. um, shared. And, and, you know, there's, a, the, the, there's that spirit, again, I mean, part of my feelings, I can't help but be animated by the people we're speaking to inside Iran. For as much as I appreciate these guests who've been coming on, when we do those episodes where we talk to young people yeah. in Iran, mm-hmm. you know, and one of them said, um, we're not tired. They're tired, you know. <laughs> I said, "Are you exhausted?" Because they're going out protesting every day. She said, "No, we we've got energy. It's the these guards and mm-hmm. these police guys and whatever that that probably, you know. I mean, I'll put it to some of our guests, but I, I don't know. Maybe you know. I'm I'm sh- I'm I gotta imagine some of them don't want to even be doing their job. They're right. they're forced course, to, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, go go shoot at your go shoot at some young people. I mean, you know how what kind of a monster do you have to be, right? Um, <clears throat> Peggy, you were saying earlier that you something that's surprised you beyond the the traction that the, the protests continuing in Iran, et cetera, and or picking up has been uh, social media continuing. Yeah, um, you didn't expect there to be. You know, I mean, I expected it from Iranians because this hits so close to home, obviously mm-hmm. for so many of us. I mean, like we've mentioned countless times, we have family members, and so many of us still call it home and you know for many different emotionally tied reasons Mm -hmm, i guess mm -hmm. but one of the things that um i don't know i i guess maybe it's more of a cynical view but i didn't expect from non-iranians is for them to continue the support and you know i know there's ebbs and flows in terms of social media campaigns and things like that so my expectation at this point in time was you know again albeit a little bit cynical Mm -hmm. was that maybe it would have died down Mm. And it's been quite the opposite, and I'm so happy that that's the case. I mean, I was I was taken aback by it, but so happy that that's the case. Yeah, over the last week, some of my neighbors or folks that I see who are non-Iranian have started asking me about Iran. Mm-hmm. Felt like it was a bit like our secret a couple of weeks yeah. ago. You know, we we all knew that things were happening, but uh, but now it it does seem to have come to some attention mind you with also some devastating news in ukraine mm-hmm. today it, it, the, the global news cycle is always yeah. shifting and mm-hmm. you know uh, bombing people in kiev is also going to yeah. take the attention away from iran not that it should be a competition but you know it couldn't but couldn't help but be, think about that mm-hmm. think about what the, the effect that's going to have well you you're one of these people who's pissed off at oprah and um i am I, I've seen this a lot in uh, why I, I mean, mean Oprah and Oprah. what is it? It's Oprah and Kamala Harris and Michelle Obama. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Those are those are the big three. Why are names. why are the, I mean, isn't there a lot of well, liberals that are not saying enough? Or why 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 those three? Are, here's the thing. I think you can be angry at a lot of people for not saying anything, and you know, rightly so. But I think these three names in particular, at least over the course of. I don't know, my adult life, Mm -hmm. I've seen them always be at the forefront of, you know, women's movements and women's rights issues and all of these things. And here we have the biggest, you know, injustice to women taking place in in our country, Iran, and not a peep. And and I mean, it's not as if, you know, the Western media hasn't picked it up to some degree. Mm -hmm. And it's not as if these individuals are so out of touch that they can't, um, you know, recognize it or hear about it or have access to it. it. It's a deliberate choice. Mm. not to say something about yeah. this. You think it's a deliberate choice? Absolutely. I mean, and wh- what wh- else is wh- preventing why? why? Why would yeah. there be a deliberate choice? I mean, I don't know. I'd love uh. to know, but <sighs> it, it has to be a choice because it's, 
I mean, you know, like we just said, the, the it is conspicuous. It it's strange that, so. yeah, why not say something? But yeah. but it seems strange. I mean, what's M- Michelle Obama's going to make an, a, a choice? I don't to, know. I know. I, I certainly know there's conspiracy people theories. in my in my <laughs> Instagram feed who will tell me that this is the liver choice and and expand on some theories of of yeah. But I, I it, it it certainly is weird. There's definitely. There's definitely a contradiction mm-hmm. uh, for for that, and many people have pointed it out. Yeah. They don't need us to point it out here, but uh, amongst the sort of I don't know progressive left in the West that takes up a lot of causes and mm-hmm. doesn't seem to be. I mean, there's a definitely exceptions. There's people who are speaking out quite a bit, but yeah. uh, but then there's folks you know who that just are being selected said one thing and didn't <laughs> yeah didn't otherwise say anything yeah. or something yeah. It's 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 kind of um, interesting. Um, well, let's get to our guests because uh, because some of them are already here. They're coming yes. into the Rook Studio. Um, Shai, if you just give me some transition music, Peg, I'll see you on the other side. Yep. And um, okay, and uh, uh, Peg is leaving the studio, and in is coming our first guest today. I guess you're not giving me transition music, uh, Shaya. <laughs> okay. Um, our first guest here in the Rook Studio, Shaw Padak Shajari Zadeh, is an Iranian women right, women's rights activist based in Toronto. She she's been arrested a few times for removing her headscarf in defiance of Iran's compulsory hijab laws in um, over the years, including in 2018. She has spoken out against Iran's repression and discrimination towards women in numerous human rights events and seminars. She was named by the BBC as one of the 100 most inspiring and influential women worldwide in 2018, and she was awarded the Geneva Summit International Women's Prize in 2020. And right now, Shapadak Shajari Zadeh joins me in the Rook studio. Hello. Hello, Jian. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me and also covering uh, the um, Iranian women's cause and also um, Iranian women in general. Thank you so much. Least we can do is give you a platform. I, I, you, you, you spoke at a protest here in Toronto on the weekend. Um, you were very powerful. It was, it was um, empowering for me even to see you up there and the words that you that you shared with everybody. Uh, just in general, if I could ask as a first question, how are you feeling these days? To be honest, I cannot uh, describe my feeling. Um, sometimes I'm. Uh, in awe with uh, with the brave uh, men and uh, women uh, in the streets, and at the same time, uh, I'm sad uh, to see uh, the horrible news of like killing um, uh, teenagers, uh, young people in the streets brutally, and uh, sometimes broken uh, to see the mass killing in some of the cities. But um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful uh, because uh, this is it. Uh, people are paying the price uh, for for liberty and democracy in Iran. And this was the day that uh, we could never have dreamed mm. of. Uh, the title of this episode uh, is, we've put it as, it's not a protest, it's a revolution. Do you agree? You? Yeah, 100%. Because... Many of my friends and many of the, the like people uh, in Iran, they're saying this time is different. It's different from uh, Green Movement 2009. It's different from 2017, and it's different from 2019. Okay. There were many people in the street protesting during that time, but this time is different because people are showing that they have had enough Iranian women started uh, this movement uh, towards a uh, revolution mm-hmm. by burning uh, the symbol of suppression of women uh, for many years uh, and um, as I always say like um, um, I was one of the like women who followed Vida Movahed the woman who made a, f- a white flag of uh, peace yes. out of her scarf and now we see uh, that uh, scarf uh, became the torch of liberty, and this torch will uh, overthrow 
this barbaric regime? You know, um, it, it, I mean, it started as protests. We, you know, we've seen it so much in, in Iran that we go, okay, that there's, now there's going to be an internet blockage and a crackdown and it'll, maybe it'll go away. But over the last week, it certainly shifted for me. For, first of all, seeing those high school girls chasing out the superintendent. I, I mean, it was so uh, empowering for anyone around the world to see that. And now this past weekend, after all the crackdowns, after all the, the shooting and arresting and killing, and to see all those young girls and boys still going out on the streets um, undaunted, uh, it's clear that they're not going to stop. That's the vibe you have as well, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. The people inside Iran, my friends, they're saying the, um, the, the cities have changed. Everything has changed. Everywhere you look, you see change. You see, like, uh, protests in different parts of cities. Uh, like, even, you know, the, like, some part of uh, capital. They are, uh, like, they are wealthy people. We didn't have, like, protests in some of the areas of the capital. Yes. But every day, every night, we see protests even in those uh, in those areas. Like we see, they are uh, tearing up the the, um, the billboards. Mm. They are they are uh, like um, writing on the walls, and like they keep going and going and going. And this is different. And this is this is gone. This is a revolution. Let me let me ask you what you think this regime is capable of, because you've. You were at the forefront of, of uh, opposing the hijab very publicly, um, uh, the White Wednesdays, the, the the Girls of Revolution Street. You've been arrested a number of times. You were beaten in jail. Um, so you know what this regime can do. I'm, 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 not, I'm imagining it's not a surprise for you to see the, the nature of the crackdown. But when we talk about, you know, I, I mentioned at the top of the, the show that uh, a dear friend of mine's sister was shot in the face for sitting in her car, um, you know, at a gas stop. I mean, uh, it's kind of a difficult conversation to have, but what do you believe the regime is capable of in terms of cracking down on people at this point? Um, let me tell you about my, my personal experience. I, uh, I have, I'm not that religion, and I don't believe in, like, uh, demon or evil, but... Uh, like I saw evil in my own eyes in that detention center that Maso died uh, like in a room with a with the interrogator I could see that uh, in in his eyes I could see that he was capable of doing anything with me mm. uh, and that's what is happening in Iran those people uh, they are capable of, of as you you've seen they are capable of beating up uh, teenagers to death. This is evil in the world. Mm. You've seen the region, all these uh, like uh, militia groups, terrorist attacks, and you see that uh, the Islamic regime in Iran is behind it. Yeah, they are capable of doing that, but at the same time, they are. Uh, it, it shows that they are so coward, and they are doing it cowardly. Mm. I guess Iranian people uh, will change their own destiny this time, and uh, they're done with this evil. It, it never stops being emotional for you, does it? I mean, you're, you have tears in your eyes now. We're just here in a studio in Toronto, and, and you deal with this 24-7, but, but even just talking about it makes you, uh, brings tears to your eyes. I'm so sorry. That's, I know sometimes it's irritating to, because I'm always... In tears and like a, a, a few days ago, the, like a reporter told me, I in, uh, I interviewed you four years ago, and you were crying and you're still crying. Mm. I'm so sorry because everything is um, emotional for me as a woman. I uh, growing up, I experienced being a second class citizen. I experienced uh, discrimination and uh, I. And I don't know, uh, like, uh, force you to leave your home uh, and everything you've built in your life, everything you've loved, 
uh, it's so hard and I, I can't still I'm I'm gra- grateful that I'm in this beautiful land um, s- since I came here um, Canada gave me a vo- gave me the voice that I have had never had in my country but uh, still uh, uh, like I have Iran in my heart and in my mind and uh, it's I'm dealing with emotional uh, uh, problems at the same time. You know, Jian, there is no rest for Iranian people. There, there, there hasn't that there hasn't been even one day yeah. that we didn't hear a bad news from Iran. Even one day. Do you remember a day a day that you? That you hadn't heard uh, like some something back every day. Yeah. Uh, they arrest a human rights activist, a, a child uh, child rights activist, a kids rights activist. Like arresting. The, the only time there isn't bad every, news is when we shut yeah, it out to yeah. because we can't take it. Another anymore. execution. Everything <laughs> about Iran is bad. Can, can can I ask you about some of the um, tactics that they the the regime uses? Um, in a situation like this because I know you and your husband were both arrested at some point and taken to Evin not that long ago just a few years ago um, and because you were accused of being spies this is something that they do right they say you must be a spy Um, tell me about that experience Uh, like uh, from the like second day that I was um, in in their custody yeah I was accused of being a spy like for uh, for Israel, for U.S. And uh, to be honest, it was in the news. It was when I got out of the prison, I, I, I saw in the news that I was accused of being a spy for Italy. Can you believe that? Italy, mm-hmm. having a spy in Iran. Because my son was going to Italian school. That, that's simple. And they said, she's going to Italian embassy every day. Yeah, I was going to the school to pick up my son. And uh, if you uh, listen to Khamenei speech uh, during uh, during that time, th- during our movement, the Girls of Revolutionary mm-hmm. State, he said he he himself said uh, like uh, the West is behind this movement. Yeah. And uh, I can say maybe some of these women got money from those Western country to take part in this uh, movement. The leader accused us of um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. being a spy and yeah. or getting uh, like um, financial support from, yeah. and this is a like this is a. Um, well, I said uh, it that's again. the way it is. I said yeah. it again last week. They said yeah. the Sharif University uprising. Americans have yeah, uh, yeah. orchestrated this somehow, yeah. right? Uh, speaking of spies, I don't know. Um, can I add something? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, and even here, uh, like. When I came here and went to the, to the Canadian Parliament, some of their uh, apologists uh, here accusing me of being a white of being a whitewash, or uh, like uh, having the support from Israel in here in Canada, because uh, because of uh, Professor Cutler, that I'm proud uh, to get to know him. Oh, Erwin Cutler helped yeah. help you be here in exile. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was going to ask you about spies because um, it's no secret that there are IRGC agents in around the world, including in in Canada, and even at a protest like the one on Saturday that you spoke at, and we did a march, there were a lot of people taking photographs. I mean, some people obviously taking videos, and you know of the, and then there's conspicuously people. Some certain people looking, you know, uh, directly into people's faces with a with a their telephones taking pictures of people, uh, and I think you also um, 
sent out a post saying, look out for this guy. You know, there's people, uh, there was somebody on the, on the uh, protest that you said was a dangerous person. Uh, you must be aware that these kind of people are infiltrating the protests here. And I'm not sure as somebody who wants to go and support how I'm supposed to navigate that, how people are supposed to be aware of this or what we're supposed to do. Do you have any insight? Uh, about what, how, how we're supposed to tell who are the, the spies who are spying on us? Uh, unfortunately, no. I can. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, we can't tell if someone has another intention. Uh, no, uh, but but we are all concerned um, about the safety of like activists here. Do you do you get worried speaking at uh, um, when you do on stage, even when you're in Toronto? Are you? Um, I mean, I, I would think you're probably beyond fear at this point. But um, is it something that you're scared of? Uh, uh, yes or no? Yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes, yeah, I felt threatened, but at the same time, I I I tell myself this is the fight. I was started in Iran, mm. and here I know I'm much safer than my sisters and brothers in Iran. Shaparak, what do you think of um, now? Obviously, that the world has heard that Canada took some measures uh, against the IRGC last week, and. Um, some folks say the government was sort of pushed into this, you know, because they weren't taking enough action. And um, there are people who are celebrating it. There's there are people who say it doesn't go far enough. What what is your feeling about what the Canadian government has done? Uh, I can say um, I'm happy that they put some names on sanction, but at the same time, as you know, uh, I came here like four years ago, but. Um, because it, it was my cause always. It has been my cause. Mm -hmm. I know that, uh, like, um, uh, demanding Canada to uh, um, to designate uh, IRGC as a terrorist organization goes back to, uh, like, 2000, uh, even 2013, mm -hmm. some of the political activists and human rights activists um, asked the government in that time to list uh, IRGC as a uh, terrorist group. And since I'm here, uh, in 2018, in, uh, they asked uh, the government, the Liberal um, Party, to put IRGC on the list of uh, terrorist organizations. Yeah. In 2019, during the uh, uh, accountability, uh, Iran's accountability week, uh, they invited, the, the parliament invited some of the um, some of Iranian activists and advocates uh, like uh, Mrs. Shirin Ebadi, mm -hmm. Ma Masi Ali Nejad, mm -hmm. and me, uh, Nika Hange Kosar. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know for sure that uh, Maryam Shafipur, and I'm, I know for sure that um, Masi, uh, Maryam, Mrs. Ebadi, and I asked for. Um, uh, First, uh, Magnitsky sanction, mm -hmm. like um, imposing Magnitsky sanction uh, on some of the architects of human rights violation in Iran, and also designating IRGC as a terrorist group. And after that, you you know, um, uh, we we had the the shooting yeah. of the flight seven five two flight yeah. yeah, and after that, like we had some people demanding justice for their loved ones uh, and they lost their loved ones Canada lost its citizen yeah. uh, by IR IRGC and uh, still um, nothing happened and I guess uh, the the phenomenal that happened last uh, um, like on um, October 1st mm. uh, Saturday uh, like um, brought attention yes it, like the Iranian, finally, the Iranian Canadian commu community came to the streets in different city, demanding the same, yes. uh, supporting uh, like the uh, Iranian protesters, and at the same time, demanding Canada to do something. That was big, and also like the leader of the conservative uh, 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 party, uh, I guess he had a big role yeah uh, and uh, for me it's not enough because uh, so far uh, I don't know what had happened I, I don't know if it's what we want or not uh, 
the, so far the government hasn't explained what kind of sanction we'll, uh, we, we are dealing with. Are they going to be after the yeah. ones who are already here? Yeah. Or is it from now on? I'm not sure because th- there hasn't been any explanation. So I don't know if I have, like, if I can be happy um, and satisfied or no. But I know for sure if, like, U.S., they put IRGC as a tourist group, that would be all, all the like. Mm. You know, yeah, it yeah. does seem. It, it again, it seemed. Um, uh, to, to be honest, I, I I was a little surprised that so many people were celebrating because it it doesn't seem like a full sort of measure. It seems, uh, it's but shady but but I guess it's. Blurry. I guess I it's a step. It's a yeah. good. It's a, and by the way, your um, your your friend uh, Nick Kosar is is right after you on this show today. So uh, he's in Washington. Uh, um, we're happy to have him back on the program too. Um, you 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 live here in exile. I know you're doing so much here, but I also think about you watching what's happening in Iran. And you did this interview um, with CNN in 2020 after you'd won that award in Geneva, and you said, "I feel guilty all the time." Uh, presumably because you wish you were still there with your your sisters, sisters and brothers. Um, do, do you do you feel like if you could, you would want to be in Iran right now on the front lines? Of course. Yeah, I, I had uh, the, the feeling of guilt with me all the time because uh, like back then my friends were in jail, my lawyer was in jail, and I was here. And I can say um, our mutual friend Sahar helped me a lot. Uh, to get rid of that feeling of guilt, I was I was crying all the time because I I couldn't live my with myself. But Sahar uh, like helped me a lot. I don't feel guilty right now, but yeah, I want to be there every moment. I I want to be there, and like I was telling my friends, if I was there, I would be one of those women and. On uh, like on those cars, and some sometimes I tell my husband, "What? What? Why did I do that? I could wait because now we have it. We're mm. burning, we're burning our scarf. If I was silent back then, I was there, celebrating, uh, like uh, mm, I was part of this." But you know, you're one of the people who enabled this to happen. Now, what's Thank happening you. is following in your footsteps. What what do you as a final question? What do you what's your message to Iranians and non-Iranians outside of Iran? Um, obviously, we we leave the the lead goes to those who are inside Iran. You know, we're we're following them. But but what do you what do you want people to do? What what do you believe we can do in the diaspora? For Iranian, uh, like for Iranians inside Iran, I can say we are all fed up with suppression, corruption, lies. But this is it. This is the revolution. If you want to to have life and to have freedom and liberty, this is the time to support the protesters, to support women, to support the young, young people, to support teenagers. This is the cause, this is the time. And for other people around the world, this is a a revolution is happening in Iran. And it's, as it says, it's uh, for life, for women and for liberty, as we know, uh, like the, uh, the liberation of women is the liberation for the whole society. And uh, at the same time, we know this is a movement for like around the world, for women around the world. The feminists uh, are saying this is a like this is a feminist movement also for the whole world. And I want them to be. I'm I'm grateful. Mm. People around the world have been supporting us. I'm grateful, but at the same time, be our voice. You can have a voice in your country. So be the, be the voice of Iranians inside Iran and tell your politicians there is a difference between Islamic regime in Iran and Iranian people. 
and Iranian people want freedom, want democracy, want peace, and uh, finally, you can have peace in Middle East, and you can have peace in the world. So stand with the Iranian people, and not the Iranian regime. Don't talk about reform. This government, this regime has proven that it's there's not going to be any reform. I was one of the people in the street in 2009 during peaceful movements of silence. Yeah. Actually, we were in the streets having protests in silence, and they killed us. They killed Neda in front of the world. Yeah. There's not going to be any reform. So this is it. If you want peace in Middle East, stand with Iranian people, not the Islamic regime. Shabarak, thank you so much for this today. The breath of the morning I keep forgetting The smell of the warm summer air I live in a town Where you can't smell a thing You watch your feet For cracks in the pain This is a special edition of Rook. The uprising is not a protest. It's a revolution. Let's go to Washington, D.C. and Nikohang Kosar. He is a distinguished Iranian-Canadian cartoonist, journalist, and blogger. Um, a lot of you guys will recognize him from his regular presence on Iran International, Radio Faradah, BBC Persian. Nikohang also runs a website called org which specializes in uh, covering Iran's water crisis and right now. Nick Kosar joins me again from Washington, D.C. Hello. Hi, Jian. Good to be with you. Nice to have you back on. You were on the program three weeks ago. I mean, it seems like so much has happened since those first days after the the killing of Massa Amini. So the title of our show today is, It's Not a Protest, It's a Revolution. Let me ask you, do you believe those words are, um, are correct or are they an overreach in your view? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I believe that uh, people are actually trying, doing their best to get rid of this regime. So it cannot be a reform or something like uh, those soft changes that some people love to see. No, that's not the case. Yeah, as I said at the beginning of the show, for me, um, uh, this this weekend especially was really pivotal. Um, first of all, seeing the undaunted determination of young people in Iran. Uh, you know, there's no fucking around. They're, they're, we're, we're, we're going, we're going, we're going. But also um, seeing, uh, you know, I mean, one doesn't know how widespread this is, but seeing some of the defections of whether it's the police or the military walking alongside protesters and, and some of the strikes we're now seeing, the, the oil uh, sector workers. Can you speak to, to those things? Uh, look, what's what we have always seen is that there have been people here and there trying to criticize the regime, trying to get a better life, but it didn't work out at all, especially for workers in the last two or three years. We had a lot of strikes, but they were not united like this one. This unity is something else. And I believe that this unity is the formula for bringing down the regime. It may take a little bit longer that's, than some expect because you're dealing with a very powerful uh, military force in the region as well. But there are people in the military that are looking at their own families, at their own family members, at their own daughters, and see that they have to actually uh, be accountable to, the, to their family members as well. And that's the point that the what's the name it's the last hair that can break the camel's back mm -hmm. straw the break yeah. the straw sorry 
Yeah, so I think that is something that we should wait for. And the other thing is that in the last three weeks, many of these security forces have not even had enough time to take a nap. So they are getting tired. Yeah. And this tiring process is going to bug them a lot. Yeah, I'm not sure if you heard um, on our last episode, on Thursdays we're doing these Voices from Iran where we're actually talking to young people um, who have done us the honor of, uh, you know, despite the dangers, um, uh, speaking to us from inside Iran um, while they're in between being on the front lines. And uh, I asked one of them, um, a woman, I, I think she was in Mashhad, uh, you know, if she's tired because, of course, they're they're just going out every day, you know. And, and she said, um, no, we're not tired. They're tired. The, the the police and the military are tired. We're we're full of energy. It was an interesting perspective, which also speaks to the fact that, you know, those taking the orders from the regime um, probably don't like what they're doing in some cases. No, many of them are, are forced to do what they're doing. And you can see that uh, in 2017, in 2019, a number of uh, police officers actually used to uh, shoot the wall or shoot the air, not to kill their own countrymen, countrywomen. So there are many people inside the police, inside the, even the uh, Revolutionary Guards that are sorry for their choices, the choices they have made in the past. But they have to come clean. Look, I don't believe in violence, but also they have to atone for their sins. Mm. And by that means, they need to support the people on the street. It's hard, but they have to do it. They are responsible and they have to come clean. Um, I guess I'm guessing you're not. I mean, you're you you have a personal history of being arrested and um, all of that as well. So but I, 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 like our other guests on today's show. I'm guessing you're not surprised by the horrendous level of um, brutal crackdown. I was telling a, a story at the beginning of the show about a, a dear friend's sister who was shot for simply being in her car with her mom. She wasn't even actually one of the people honking the horn. Not that that would be something that you should get shot for. But but this is the level of crackdown. Um, I, I'm guessing that doesn't surprise you. No, uh, many of their sharpshooters are actually killing innocent people, bystanders, people even s watching the events from their windows. So these people just, uh, these monsters, I, ca I can't call them people, these monsters just want to scare off people. And this is going to be um, happening if people don't make the system tired of itself. Right now, when Mohsani Ejei, the the head of judiciary, the high judge of the country, says that, okay, let's talk. Let's have a conversation. It means that they are scared for their future. I was going to ask you specifically about that. Yes. And I, I mean, I don't know how else to interpret that other than a, a regime that's scrambling between killing people and saying, let's negotiate. I, you, your interpretation is that this is a, a regime on the run somehow? I think it is. And I've met this guy because when I was when I was summoned to the press court, I saw him uh, in the lobby of the uh, court. And he's a scary individual, really scary individual. I think he has sentenced over a thousand people to death since uh, 1979. So when he is trying to play the soft spoken person, it shows that, no, the wolf is actually scared of the sheep in a way. The, the last time you were on, Nick, uh, three weeks ago, you you were um, very critical of the the Canadian government. You were critical of, of what you called the amphibians, the, uh, the Iranian Canadians or the people here of Iranian descent that are kind of playing both sides. And, and I, I want to ask you about them in a second, but, but you were critical of the Canadian government, um, for, for, for not taking a stronger stance. So of course there was this announcement last week that, um, some folks are interpreting as a, uh, as a, a victory, although something that they were pushed into. Uh, what is your interpretation of the, what is your feeling about um, the step that the Canadian government has taken? Look, if you want to look into how we should interpret this, let's see what uh, members of the PS752 families are saying. On one side, you have 
those who are very satisfied. And on the other hand, you have people who are not satisfied at all, people like Shaheen Mogaddam. And he, he makes a good point. Okay, do those people uh, who are going to be blocked have a visa that we're going to block their uh, visas or block them from entering Canada? What would happen to their families if their families want to enter Canada and bring the money that belongs to the Iranian people to Canada? What happens there? And 10,000 members of IRGC, look, there are many members of IRGC who have the opportunity to leave the country by using fake names, fake passports. And if they have lots of money and they can hire the services of a, let's say, immigration lawyer, a business immigration lawyer in Canada, how sure are we that these people won't enter the country? What are we going to do with the uh, money that the partners of IRGC have brought in Canada and invested in uh, real estate businesses? How are we going to investigate that? I can tell you that I know people who actually sent proposals and concept papers to the Canadian government in the last few years and asked for small amount of funds to investigate which partners of IRGC and the Iranian regime have invested in real estate in Canada. Silence was the answer we, those people got from Canada. Look, the thing is, we have to come clean. Why, why are we asking this question in 2022? Mm. We know that so many uh, criminals or family members of criminals have landed in Canada all these years. Mm. Yeah, it was, it, 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 Canada represents some kind of a I mean, it's strange as a Canadian kid sitting here too uh, and watching the Iranian community grow and flower here, but Canada represents a, a, a real paradox at this point because on the one hand, uh, the, the steps that have been taken by the government last week would be seen as far ahead of many other countries. But on the other hand, Canada in particular has been the country that has, um, you know, been considered a haven, right, for a lot of this money coming from Iran um, and a lot of it related to the IRGC, etc., uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2019, I went to Ottawa as a witness to the um, Subcommittee on Human Rights in the Canadian Parliament. And I mentioned the IRG, the people close to IRGC who have invested in Canada. Who are, and again, in June, I did a video uh, meeting with the committee, with the Subcommittee on Human Rights. and. I again talked about those partners of the Revolutionary Guards who have invested in Canada and nobody cares. That's sad. That's really sad because when you ask people to investigate, they say, oh, look, it takes a lot of um, energy and funds to find out who's who. Are we supposed to talk about it now or when they were uh, being granted um, entry to Canada, we had to know where their money came from? That's a, that's that's really sad to hear that uh, some people are saying no. Uh, you know those people were very nice people, so we let them come in with their millions of dollars. Right. How could you wire millions of dollars to Canada while all the banks in Iran are uh, banned by SWIFT and other uh, systems that can, you can actually transfer money from? So so in plain so so in plain terms, so that I understand, what would be the hesitancy? Uh, faced with information like this and faced with a lot of uh, people um, being pretty angry right now, what would be the hesitancy of the of the Canadian government from going further? I mean, what Look, they have to uh, many people in the Canadian government have to uh, actually answer to this question. First of all, why did you let these people in? One, two. When you knew about their histories, what did you do? When you know, when you let's say the um, some liberal some liberals are saying that uh, the Harper government let Mahmoud Zaha very enter the country and stay here and buy real estate and do businesses. Now his son is a very um, powerful businessman in Toronto. Great, but how did this happen? Okay, we say the Conservatives did that and didn't say anything for three years. The Liberals have been in power since 2016, I guess, right? Hmm. So what have they done? It's not just about Khavari, it's about other individuals as well. You know, 
a few years ago, a, a, fa a friend of mine went to uh, travel to Toronto and said that he had been able to use his Iranian uh, bank card hmm. in northern Toronto. Right, right. How could that happen? Right. That's a big question. So, 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 let me ask you about something else that you. I mean, uh, also mindful that much of our audience is not in Canada, so they're sort of. I know. <laughs> yeah, we're in the weeds now on, on the Canadian policy, but I think it's important because Canada is such a plays such a big role in the diaspora at this point. Um, but, 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 so does the next question I want to ask you, which is something that you had told me you want to talk about, and you're you're concerned about folks in the diaspora who you have seen in the past as. I guess regime enablers in some way uh, now seemingly jumping ship and joining the resistance. Tell me why that's a concern for you. Look, there have been many people in the uh, in Northern America, not just only in Canada, who have been associates of the Iranian reformists. They were fighting for Khatami, they were fighting for Musevi, they were fighting for Javad Zarif, Rouhani, and they, in a way, campaigned here. They got funds from the Canadian government, they got funds from the U.S. government, they had projects with the University of Toronto everywhere. We know some of them. They were supporters of Zarif, of Rouhani, Rapprochement, and these people who actually jumped on the Rapprochement bandwagon have to tell us why they did it. Why? Because look, the, the the big question is where does the money, if if we have an Iran deal, if there's a nuclear deal with Iran, where does the money go? Where does the money land? It lands in the pockets of Ayatollah Khamenei and certain people who, at the end of the day, transfer a lot of those funds to Canada and other places. That's one thing that they have to answer to. Two, they have tried to fund and assist and accommodate. Ayatollah Khamenei and IRGC indirectly. And today we are seeing that this regime is murdering people, is murdering girls, young boys, young children. The, I, I, I guess I, I, I think, let me just check out right now, because a friend of mine sent a list. So far, 23 children and teenagers yeah. have been murdered by the regime. Yeah. Up to possibly yesterday. More, yesterday. So any t type of support for this regime means supporting the murderers of our children. They have to come clean and they have to announce that, okay, we made that wrong choice. We made a mistake and we're going to pay for our mistakes. It's not free. What do you mean pay for our mistakes? Look, they have to, they have to financially support the people who are, who have lost a lot mm. of money in Iran, people who are joining strikes are not going to be paid by the government anymore. These people need financial support. If they say, oh, all the uh, wire transfer system is blocked, how did you transfer money from Iran to here? Find a way and find a legal way to support people in Iran. If you believe that you have to do something, yeah. then do it. It's, no. you, you, you know, if, if I can, I mean, ask this, I'm trying to get my head around it, you know, on a macro level. Because, uh, and I say this with the uh, the liberty of being someone who, as a product of you know um, my family coming here a long time ago, growing up in the West, and and you know I, I I have a clear conscience about having nothing to do with this regime other than opposing it uh, very publicly for for decades. But but uh, this idea of whether you know everybody should be on the bus right now um, to make sure you know in the effort to get rid of the regime uh, and we put off any of this kind of talk of you know who who should have got on earlier and who shouldn't have or whether this is the conversation to have now because certainly we know that revolutions can be co-opted by one group one political interest and and hijacked that way so uh, and you know if we don't call this out in advance so how how do you get your head around this? Look, one thing is that um, until this moment, we know that there are no political leaders behind it. And the and the people who are fed up with the regime, especially youngsters, are going to the streets and uh, putting their lives at risk. This is different from the Green Movement, that a part of the regime was fighting the other part of yes, the regime. Yes, yes. To, to continue Khomeini's path, not to bring democracy. The big mistake that so many had about the Green Movement 
was that they thought it was all about democracy. From day one, I was saying, no, this is not about democracy because Mir Hossein Mousavi has not been held accountable for being part of the regime that murdered many people in the 1980s. And people hated me for saying that. Or people were supporting Rafsanjani. I said, oh, Rafsanjani is a very good man. No, he's not a good man. He right. murdered many people. Right, right. It was, it was, it was part of a, uh, an ideology or philosophy that this is a, the, we're going to do this step by step, which we've now, of course, learned was a fallacy and and a dream. And folks like you are, as I said to our Subhani last week, um, get to say I told you so to everybody if you if you want to. But in terms of how we use our time now, do we go after the media figures that we? are convinced we're not saying the right things over the last few years or or is that time well spent tell me about how you feel. They, they have to they have to come clean they mm. have to come clean uh, you cannot play both sides you cannot it's it, there's no gray area over here either you're with them or with the people those individuals who censored people like me all these years have to come clean now why did you censor people like Nick or Arash Sopani or others? Because, because of what? Were they saying anything wrong? Hmm. Were they lying? That's that's look. And one thing that you are doing that's really great is giving a voice to the people by your own means. Mm -hmm. We have. To, I I believe that we have this privilege of being members of the media or being powerful in social media or whatever. To do this, and this is the time to actually do uh, to do such a thing. I remember this conversation from the movie Maverick. He said, "Don't think, just do." Hmm. I think we have to just do because we have thought about it for years. Let me ask you a, a, a final question. You know, I really appreciate every time you come on. Thank you for doing this. Uh, you're, oh this is all voluntary on all of our parts. Nobody's getting uh, um, getting rich doing this. Uh, you, I appreciate you volunteering your time. Are you? Are you more or uh, less hopeful this week? I am more hopeful. It just takes more time. That's the only difference. I'm not thinking that things would happen in just, let's say, like a, a blink of an eye or a flash. No, it, it will take time. And the other thing is that in the trans after the downfall of the regime, whenever it happens, would it be this year, next year, we have to be smart. Because right now, everybody is thinking about the revolution. But people have forgotten that there are thousands of people in Hamadan who are still thirsty, in Shahra Kord who are still mm. thirsty, in Sisan and Baluchistan who don't have water. And water is still the, a major problem. But because everybody is focusing on the uh, unrest in Iran, they forget. Because, because kids are being factors. killed? Because kids are being killed, yeah. Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah. But the thing is, in the next few months, people would have no water in many parts of the country. In the next few years, people will have no food. So I have to both think about what's happening on the streets today and what's happening in the background. Yeah. So it's very complicated. We yeah, have to be. Yeah, I mean, everything. there's this little All dream that there's this little dream that a lot of us have, you know, that that um, that the regime you know collapses and all this all this money and effort and support comes back into iran and and everything changes and it becomes this it becomes the the the, the paris of the middle east again etc um but there are structural issues like for example with water that we've learned that no amount of 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 money and support can change overnight right that's how yeah. endemic the issues are that that are going to take a long time to reverse and 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 especially during that transition period, people are going to watch how the new government is going to play. And if they don't solve a lot of those problems, some people would say, oh, we had a good time under the regime. And this is how we could see some elements of IRGC gain power again. Mm. We have to be smart. Uh, Nick, thanks for this. We'll talk soon. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye.
The Uprising. It's not a protest, it's a revolution. This is a special edition of Rook. I'm Gian Gameshi. We're back in the Rook studio here with my next guest. Mojgan Mwarifizadeh is a human rights advocate, a public speaker, a legally trained refugee law paralegal with a bachelor's degree in English teaching and translation. She's just recently landed in Canada. Uh, after doing some great refugee advocacy work in Indonesia. We're very happy to have her here in the Rook studio. Hello, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. What, well, we were talking before the show, actually, you were um, here early, and we were saying that um, uh, <laughs> we, we had actually booked you some weeks ago to do your story because it's quite a compelling one, and now fate has intervened. Yeah. There's a... Uh, a revolution afoot uh, in Iran, and uh, but it's good timing in the sense that you certainly have some things to say about it. So thank you for doing this, first of all. You're welcome. Um, you were at this big demonstration here in Toronto uh, a week or so ago that we had over 50,000 people, um, and you've just recently come to Canada. You wrote on Instagram, today for the first time in my life, I was able to express myself without worrying to get shot or arrested. Um, tell me about that feeling, Mojka. It just felt liberating to be able to express myself in that way. And I have never seen such a crowd of Iranians in one place. Because, I mean, in 2009, from what happened in Iran, I was in the protest all the time. Mm -hmm. And those protests were smaller than what I saw in Toronto the other day. And it was just so liberating to see that and feel that all these people with different beliefs and different groups of the society are just together and now after all those years we all have a common voice mm -hmm. and we are just saying one name and that was just so beautiful to me and I was there without any fear you know shouting at the top of my voice and nobody was telling me you can't do that. Well, just to get a into a little bit of your backstory, I mean, you have actually been outside of Iran for about nine years. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel like you couldn't do that in the last few years since you left Iran? Well, I did that, but where I was, there wasn't a large community of us, of Iranians, that, you know, could be a big voice. I did that as much as I could, you know, through my own means, social media, podcasting and advocating, talking to different groups outside of the country as much as possible. But... It wasn't until I came here and saw this huge crowd of Iranians in one place that I thought I can do so much more here. You you ended up the last few years in Indonesia, yeah. uh, and you ended up a, a being a, a very vocal and prominent advocate for refugees. It wasn't your intention to be in Indonesia no. all these years. Tell us what happened briefly. So we left Iran a couple of years after what happened in 2009. Um, my dad was advertising for the opposition and we were followed and his shop got shut down. And we thought that, you know, if we move uh, places from one city to another and just hide for a little bit, it will calm down mm -hmm. and then we can go back to our lives. And nobody knew. Our relatives didn't know what was happening. We just suddenly, you know, saw that we, we disappeared. My friends were like, where is she? They just disappeared. Um, so we did hide um, in different towns for a while and we were still being followed. As soon as we had a little bit of communication with the outside world, we were being followed again. So we just had no choice but to leave and leave so quickly. How would you know that you're being followed, by the way? Well, they would, the security forces would come to our house. Oh, okay. <laughs> <That's> that. <It> was <laughs> yeah. that, it was that overt? It wasn't mm -hmm. yet. Yeah. yeah, it just wasn't over yet. We yeah. couldn't use our identity. It was just too crazy. Um, so when we wanted to leave, I mean, until the last moments, we did not want to leave. We didn't want to believe that we actually have to leave the country. Um, and yeah, obviously we didn't have much choices. So we just, you know, got hold of a travel agent. We're like, where can we go? And he just gave us a couple options. Do you want to go to Turkey? Do you want to go to Indonesia? I was like, where is Indonesia? <laughs> I had no idea. But yeah, it happened so quickly. And the deal was we go to Indonesia for three days with a little tiny carry-on and they will take us to Australia from there. Wow, yeah. Ten years later, <laughs> yeah. my family are still stuck in Indonesia. Oh, your family's still there. Yeah, I had to leave them. You, I mean, you've written that the Islamic Republic should go to hell, your, yeah. your words, and that other countries should accept Iranian refugees. This is now an area of your expertise. Mm -hmm. You said that you were actually told by a UN officer, a United Nations officer, that Iran is very safe and you should go back. 
Yes. Tell, tell us that story. So in 2019, um, we received a call from the Canadian Embassy in Indonesia that, like every other refugee that goes through the resettlement process, that we are booked for an interview um, to go to Canada, basically. The same process that I went through last year to come here. Mm. Um, and because of my activities, because I was so public, because I was helping people, um, this UN officer, just one day before our interview, they contacted us and said, come to the UN building, we need to talk. So we go there. In, in Indonesia, Jakarta? Where in Jakarta. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in Jakarta. So we go to the UN office and they sit us down. And this officer just comes in like angrily and rudely telling to my face that we are not going to send you to Canada. You're not eligible. Iranians are liars. Your case is not real. Your refugee claim is not real. Although I hold a refugee card. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all Iranians are liars. Basically, Iran is safe. Go back to Iran. You have international connections. Go find yourself a sponsor. Fundraise through your connections and go that way. How did you respond to that? I tried convincing that officer, but she was just not having it at all. Mm. So after we walked out of the UN office, my dad attempted suicide. He oh. ended up in a mental health hospital for a few weeks, and I guess he never recovered after that. So yeah, that was like the huge backlash. Meaning he's, he's still he's still alive. Is yeah, he? yeah, he is. Um, I mean, he just attempted uh -huh. <laughs> suicide. But he's, not, he's just emotionally yeah uh, tapped out I, mm -hmm. I, what what does especially given that you come from a, a family that was active against mm -hmm. this regime what do you make of what's going on in iran now and uh, and uh, then i'll ask if you have had conversations with your your family about it too yeah i did have conversations with my family actually for my organization i do have a staff that live in iran and i'm not able to get hold of them for days at a time because of the internet you know shut offs and everything and it's just horrible. One of my staff, she's telling me that I cannot walk on the street without hearing a gunshot mm. or seeing someone grabbing in a girl in, Tehran? in Shiraz. In Shiraz. Yeah, she's in Shiraz. She's like, I cannot, I just cannot go out. It's too scary I, to go to work, to go out, to walk on the street. I see they grab girls and put them in a van and take them and men are standing there doing nothing. Some people try to fight back, but mm. you know, it's just not enough. and. It's been horrible since since the day I landed in Canada. All this craziness happening. It's just been, it's just been bizarre. It's just been crazy. It's nothing like any of the other protests that I've ever seen happen back home. Can you explain why um, you're not the first person to say it's challenging uh, as an Iranian to get refugee status, and you know. <laughs> I mean, now the world is seeing, if they hadn't seen it before with this mm -hmm. regime, people being shot for for no reason. I mean, Masa Amini, mm -hmm. the name that we repeat is because she she did nothing and was ended up in a prison and then and then dead. Um, why is it such a challenge for Iranians to get refugee status? The UN officers, from my experience, straight up think of you as a liar unless you can mm -hmm. prove them wrong in, in all in, the different in, in all over the world or in, in, in just in your I'm not sure in all over I mean from what I hear from other refugees all over the world that yes. contact my organization for support for yes. preparation for their interviews when they go through the refugee status determination process they, they all say the same thing that they are not treated right that they think Iran is safe from what all the authorities talk on TV I mean obviously they're not going to say anything differently right like right now they're saying oh our police is not even carrying guns or the, the riot police is not <laughs> treating people bad yeah. on the street yeah. so what is this that we're seeing on the street obviously that's one reason and the UN officers have this source that they look at of to t tick boxes, you know, to see if you are eligible refugee or not. And because of what is going on, those resources all say Iran is a safe place for them to live in. And I don't know, they just consider to consider that you are lying. In a, in a moment like, the, first of all, is your organization hearing from Iranians right now? Yes. And what are they saying? Well, they're looking for ways to get out of the country. Yes. They're looking for safe. And ways. is it I, I have. I really don't know the mechanics of this. Is it easier because of what's going on right now to be able to get people out of the country? Well, it's not. Getting them out of the country is one thing. 
and then having them be registered by the UN and go through the refugee status determination process is another thing. Okay. I, we still don't know how they would you know, take it from now on. Is it going to be different or not? Because none of them have actually come out and this went through this process for us to see. But definitely there is more to build on right now um, on people's cases. There's much more evidence although big uh, media is not really talking about it that much, but there are still at least some things mm -hmm. to, you know, to push uh, for the different claims that Iranians can have. So I personally think it's going to be a little tiny easier for Iranians to claim asylum, but um, yeah, before that it was just too crazy. What do you, from your perspective, um, what do you feel like we could or should be doing in the diaspora in a place like Canada? to um, help the, the folks on the front lines in Iran? Well, we need to be their voice. We need to force the governments to actually take action. I mean, you saw what happened with the Canadian government, right? At the beginning, they were just not having it. But then with the push from the Iranians and what happened in Toronto and other cities, they actually heard our voices. So yeah, collective voices definitely will have you know some impact. And I think we just need to continue. Um, with voices from within the country that are continuously being shut down, you know, we can we can just double that and push the governments. That's I think the only thing we can do right now. And do you do you have a, a personal sense of where you think? I mean, as you said, I mean, everybody sort of says this time is different. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you feel like that? Do you feel like this is? unstoppable now somehow it is i feel like it's coming from the rage that has been within us for years right the rage of not having a home not having fundamental human rights and like we're sick of it i am sick of it i am in canada and i never thought after 12 years of displacement within the country and outside the country somebody again in service ontario is going to ask me for my passport <laughs> or my id card with a picture on it it's frustrating. It's re-traumatizing to have to go through that. And yet the rage just comes alive again. It's like the old wound that people keep touching and keep touching. I'm like, don't ask me for my ID. It is the point of my frustration. This is the point that I lose control over it because I don't have a home. Canada is not my home. I don't feel like I am home yet. My Half of my family is in another part of the world that when I physically mm. look at the globe, it frightens me for leaving them there without any rights. And my family in Iran, my cousins are all being like shot and torn and injured on the streets. Like I absolutely don't feel like I am home, although that I know I am safe here as Is a your, person. Do, 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 have family members of yours actually been shot in Iran? Um, not shot, but injured on the street injured. when they went to the well, protest. They were protesting and they, yeah, they, they were protesting. in what city? In Ahvaz, in Ahvaz. A, a large um, number of my family members are in Ahvaz, in Karaj, in Isfahan. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have family all over, <laughs> all over Iran. Shout out to the Khuzestan. Uh, yeah. That's the, my family, uh, uh, okay. my, my dad's side, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm from there. I was uh. born on, on the border of Iraq and Iran. Oh, wow, like yeah. Abadan or something? Yeah, I was born there. I was born in Ahvaz. My dad was born in Abadan, but we lived in Abadan for a long time in Ahvaz as well. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so if... if it's interesting where you say I, you, I'm from nowhere right now. Do you, does does home still feel is is home Iran then? Where is, is home? It is Iran. Like a lot of people say, home for me is not a physical place anymore. It's not a house that you can feel safe in. It's a place that can give you identity, that can make you feel calm and feel safe and you know have all of that i mean when when i arrived here i thought this would feel like home but i feel like a tourist here i don't know maybe because i'm new here uh, it will feel better You're pretty over new. time I yeah mean, maybe you gotta give <laughs> yourself a chance to settle it just, in but, yeah. <laughs> it just feels like i am a tourist in this place mm. and it's not my it's not my city it's not my my hometown a lot of iranians here though yeah, I mean, Does I, I saw in Richmond Hill, like yeah. a large, I was like, this is, no wonder they call it Toronto, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> My partner is not Iranian, he's Indonesian Chinese, and he was looking at like the shops and be like, honey, all of them are Iranian names. <laughs> I cannot believe we, we are in Iran, and now he insists that we go live in Richmond Hill because he just loves it. <laughs> and do you, do you feel like you, you would, um, well, yeah, well, it sounds like you would, move back to Iran if you had mm -hmm. if, if there's a 
Yeah. The res- revolution is complete at some point. Yeah. Um, do you feel, I was asking Shaparek this earlier, do you feel a sense, give, given that you are, you're somebody who speaks out, given that your own history of protest, etc., is there part of you that wishes you were there right now? A part of me wishes I was there, but I would be dead in like day two of the protest. From the way that I express myself and like go out there in front of the bullets, probably I'd be dead by now. So maybe it's better use of me here to be the voice of people who are fighting back home and yeah, just try to make a difference this way. Omojgan, thank you for doing this today. You're welcome. Go to London, the UK. Kimia Yousafi is a British Iranian social media influencer with a law degree. She has been very outspoken about the current situation in Iran. Uh, she's been participating in the protests there. Right now, Kimia Yousafi joins me from London, England. Hello, welcome back on the show. Hi, thank you for having me back. Well, it's nice to see you and talk to you. I mean, you've been very active in London, attending protests, etc. First of all, how do you how do you feel in general these days? I genuinely feel so stressed. You quite like and, and useless to be honest. I feel like I can't do anything about. It. I think this is how most Iranians feel right now outside of Iran. The best we can do is like social media, but. Do you know that feeling of stress you have every single day? You're just on your phone, like scrolling every yeah, day, yeah. trying to get news. Yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah, it's a it's a new um, pastime for those of us, at least in the diaspora. You're just sort of constantly scrolling through, oftentimes seeing the same devastating video over and over again being posted by people. Right? Yeah, it's not it's not pleasant at all. And I keep just seeing like violence, like the police and the the guards and everything showing violence to the people. It's not nice because you can't you can't do anything about it. To me, that's not normal. I see that. I'm like, oh my god, the police in England would never do that. Yeah. But then at the same time, you're like, wait, it's Iran. That's how oppressed the people are. Yeah. Uh, what what has it been like for you? First of all, what, we talk a lot about the demonstrations here in Toronto, and we've talked to people in LA. And what what has it been like in London, being there amongst other people of Iranian descent at those protests and demonstrations, in support of those in Iran? Oh my God! You know, um, so many people suddenly all came together. People that don't even probably speak to each other or people that don't even know each other. I've never seen these people in my life before. And suddenly, I think it was last Saturday, actually, a huge, everyone were there. Everyone shouting, screaming, supporting each other, supporting the people of Iran. That's so heartwarming. It's like it really warms your heart to see that. It's nice because we, you know, it, we're like a... How can I say it? Not like a family, but we f- we all feel connected somehow to each other when we're there. And that's a really nice feeling. You feel like you've got, you feel a bit of safety with you, you feel a bit of hope. Yeah. It brings you a lot of hope. It's weird, isn't it? It's such a, I mean, we've been talking about this, but it's such a confluence of feelings. I mean, you're absolutely right. The stress and the 
the constant concern and the harrowing, you know, the, the sort of one one eye cocked to opening up the, the phone to see what you're going to see yeah, next. Exactly. In terms of, but at the same time, it, it, it is exhilarating. I mean, just watching the these brave young people in Iran or, or, or seeing the strength in the diaspora of all these people coming out. I mean, we, you know, when we did the whole special about London there and, and one of the things that marked it was that there isn't a huge Iranian community there. And yet I've seen like thousands, you know, at these protests in London and it must, must feel like you've discovered your community, you know? Yeah. It's really, really nice. Like I said, it really brings you hope. It doesn't matter. Like, you see a group of people like, oh my God, that's the group of people that I had a fight with the other day. Or like, not me, but it's just how it is. And you're just like, oh my God, there's that group doesn't speak to that group. Or, you know, they had a fight. But you see them next to each other shouting and protesting. And that just shows how, no matter how bad people are together with each other, how much Iranian people have each other's backs. It's really nice. It brings you hope for the future. Uh, you wrote, uh, Kimia, on Instagram, uh, if you try to silence the people of Iran, they will only get louder. You can't silence them. They are strong. They are brave. I mean, uh, you know, this isn't the first protest movement in Iran uh, in the last 43 years. And, and one could argue there have been occasions in the past where ultimately voices have been silenced. This does feel different. I mean, hence the title of this episode. It's not a protest; it's a revolution. But, but tell me about that sentiment that you wrote about. You, you, you can try to silence them; they'll, they'll, they'll only get louder. Um, with Iranian people, it's—I don't mean in a way of shouting or doing something, doing anything. You know, in terms of people making people outside be their voice. That's what they're like, you know, Iran has tried to shut the internet off. They still found a way to get news across. They they are killing people or they are injuring people. And those people come out of hospital and still find a way to yeah. put the news out there or go back out there. So that's what I mean. No matter how much you beat them down, they, they might go to the hospital, they might be injured, and they're, they're going to come out with a cast on their arm or, I don't know, injuries everywhere but they'll still be out on the streets like for me that's you don't see that anywhere else to be honest they go i i saw a post the other day and this this girl sent um, a voice note saying um what did she say she said yeah uh, we're at the hospital but as soon as we get better we're gonna go back out there again yeah. and i was just yeah. like wow that's what i mean you're one of the the reasons why a lot of people know you, a lot of people in Iran, is is your your social media presence. Um, you, you posted something saying that your Instagram stories and TikTok videos have been blocked or taken down. What yeah. what got blocked and and what do you make of that? So I posted a video on TikTok um, after my first video about Masamini, saying that you know the world isn't doing enough and saying basically how some countries for example britain itself and united states have all stayed silent and how you know for black lives matter and for ukraine and the australian fire and everything everyone came together and were helping but no one seems to be helping iran and um it got i don't know if it got reported or something like that but it got blocked literally three four minutes later apparently i was violating community guidelines and i was like how mm. i didn't i didn't swear i didn't say anything bad i just said that iran needs support how is that getting blocked it was really weird so i posted another video after that and that didn't get blocked what what do you make of things getting blocked what, what is that what, what it you you you'd be a, a good person to ask i mean this is you've done this a lot what what is it that you think there is the offensive content the offensive content is saying it how it is it's like tiktok and instagram and you only just find this out you know i've been so simple and instant to know these things but it's like these people are all together when you think about it i mean I saw a video of a dog eating another dog 
on TikTok and that wasn't taken down. And there was blood everywhere. It was gruesome. But me talking about Iran, how it needs support, is getting blocked for what reason? This is what I mean. The media at the moment is trying to silence people and everyone. You think and that there's actually they- a you think that there's actually an effort to to silence a uh, conversation about Iran? Yes, definitely. And what would the definitely incentive be for the media does. to do that? Uh, sorry. What would the incentive be for the media to do that? No one wants Iran to go back to how it used to be. It was a very powerful country. It was becoming a very powerful country. When you think about it, if I remember correctly, it was 1973 that the Shah said basically, I don't want to give my oil out for free anymore. Let's make a contract. I don't want it to be out for free. He was, when you watch videos of him, he was way ahead of his time. Iran would have been a very powerful country, very powerful country, if obviously the Mullahs didn't take over. But that that's what I think. No one, people, not no one as in not people, but countries like the United States or maybe England or Australia or whatever, they're quite scared of, Iran thriving that's what it was doing and that's why they kind of stopped it that's what they're scared of I think they're scared of Iran getting its power back and going to how it used to be you're certainly not the first to say that um Kimia you you've one of the reasons why you have a big following is you talk about um being a an Iranian girl uh from a cultural perspective from a from a social perspective from a political perspective sometimes uh, just before I let you go, reflect on what you've been feeling as you watch um, not just Iranian women, but high school girls, elementary school girls, and of course boys as well, uh, and, and men supporting them. Um, reflect, if you will, on on what you feel when you see the courage that they're demonstrating these days. I cannot tell you the amount. I feel so proud and i'm like oh my god i wish i could be there to fight next to them and just be you feel proud you're like you see these iranian little girls literally half my age or in the teachers no it wasn't a teacher it was a principal in his in his face like get out get out they threw him out imagine these young people they're just the whole new generation and they are the generation that Iran needs and they're taking everything forward. Every person that you see in the streets, they're all very young. Yeah. You don't see the older people yeah. going out. You, they, they do go out, but most of them are very young. They, how can I say this? Um, They understand a lot more than at their age. They're really wise. They really and do. That, they really do. They're very wise. I think it, it might be because they had a hard life than other people their age in other countries or they had to learn so they could survive whatever it is but they've had enough and i love it i love seeing this and i was literally on my way to work this is happening every morning now it's become my daily ritual i'm just crying on my way to work i see a video and i just break down crying it's because at the same you feel really proud it's happy tears but at the same time you're like i wish i could do something instead of just share this mm. i'm just sharing this what signing petitions going out in protest what else can i do i want to be there but you just, you can't mm. so you feel a sense of proudness and a sense of helplessness if that makes sense did you cry you on the way help- to work today yeah do you remember I what did. you were looking at i was uh, watching a video of a girl just holding her hand out like this and a woman came and just hugged her uh, the hugging video yeah have you seen that i yeah. saw that one um the other day i saw um a girl bringing flowers to the guards yeah i started crying at that one the other day i saw um of a guy posting a video saying please people come out come to the streets let's finish this once and for all and he was only young sorry yeah this is all you know it genuinely gets you like really tearful it's like happy tears and like sad tears and everything you don't see me crying 
<laughs> it's genuinely like you feel so useless like you don't know what to do yeah but it's it's I, it, it brings me hope it brings me a lot of hope when I first, before I posted my first video, my dad had to sit me down and he said, Kimmy, you have a big base of following. You have to either choose. You can either go back to Iran and not post this and go see your family. You haven't seen your family for a very long time. Yeah. Or you post this and you might have to say bye to Iran for a very long time. And I had a really hard think about it. And I said, why should I stay silent about this? It's my country. So I posted the video and I'm 100% sure, like, it's, it's gone, it's gone, you know, it's got a lot of views. So I'm 100% sure that I won't be able to go back, but it doesn't really matter to me. I haven't been back for 16 years. If it means not going back for one more year or two more years, yeah. I don't mind. But sorry, I'm babbling, but yeah. No, you're, you're not babbling. Does. All of us have made that deal at some point. I mean, I, I face the same thing. I, I desperately would love to see my family in Iran. I would desperately like to see them. I would desperately like to see Iran. And it's just not been a reality for years because uh, I say or do things that um, the regime wouldn't um, uh, take kindly to. But uh, I think um, for me and, and I guess for you, it's 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 worth it to um, to speak out, especially right now, to be trying to support in any way as you say those those people who are on the front lines um and it's it's amazing you know the the amount of folks i've talked to of like different ages of uh, different occupations different amounts of time they've been outside of iran who talk about the pride they have now in being iranian because of these young people in the streets i mean they're doing a they're they're doing us all a favor. It feels like by yeah, by, by their definitely. strength, you know. Definitely, it's one of those things where um, I've said it as well, and it's as harsh as it is to say. If nothing happens now, I really don't think anything will happen ever again, and things will get a lot worse. And all these young people that have been killed in the streets is just going to go to waste. And I really, I really hope at the bar. I know, I know something will happen. Yeah. I just have a feeling it, it, that I know something positive will come out of this. It's certainly, a, it's just a matter of time in terms of the, uh, yeah. the, the old, the uh, old bearded guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The time has come. It's time for the, um, it's time for a good turnaround. It's time for a change, a good change. Thanks for this. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. This dream I'm dreaming. Won't you wake me up tonight? Cause this life I'm living doesn't really feel like this strange dream. Never thought you would leave I never thought I'd have to start again Somebody That is Kimia Yousefi in London, England. And uh, as we've been finishing that talk, two gentlemen have walked into the studio here a, little, a bit of a special treat here before we end off rook for today they are one of the most dynamic musical groups in the uh, iranian landscape creating a fusion of folk electronic rock and pop sounds often with a classical persian touch as well they are dang show of course and they feature two brothers at their core our very own shaya shoja and his older brother taha they have a concert on october 23rd in toronto at the lula lounge but first right now dang show Taha and Shai are with me in the Rook studio. Hi, guys. Hi, hi. This is a long time coming. Uh, yeah, I was waiting to, for you to have me here. Well, maybe in, this, this doesn't count. 
Hesab Nadir. This is not the official Dang Show appearance because I want to do a the 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 story of Dang Show. We're I want to do. It. We were supposed <laughs> to do it, and we got. De- in fact, this was the time we yes. were going to do it, but uh, of course, uh, world events have um, have superseded everything. But you, but we decided we would still do something here because you guys have a a special song you want to play for us. So let let me get to that. But before we do that, I I, I should ask you both about the current moment. Um, Taha, I mean, you guys have a your own harrowing history with um, with this current regime. Um, what does it feel like to be witnessing, albeit from afar, uh, a, a new revolution afoot in Iran? Uh, I will answer you first personally, in personally aspect. I'm happy that I'm not there because I'm an artist. I should produce I should do something for my nation. I should be their voices. And if I was there, I could have like published one song and they would have arrested me. Right. So, I by You my, would be neutered if you were there. You yeah. wouldn't be able to actually do anything. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, when I see them, my heart is beating for them. I wanted to be there, but this is my duty, my chore to be their voice not to be in the street for my for my vision as an artist mm. if i couldn't produce something useful yeah that was better for me to go to the street but these days i'm happy that i can produce and we are producing after like 3 weeks we have more than 4 or 5 songs written about the situation mm. It's such an interesting perspective to say that, actually, because a lot of people will say, well, I wish I was there right now on the front lines, et cetera. But you're absolutely right. You, Your greatest contribution, uh, especially because you have a fan base, co- can be to create art uh, at this time, to support in whatever way you, way you can artistically. And yet you wouldn't actually be able to do that in Iran without um, some kind of repercussions, likely, right? Yeah, that's the exact reason that we decided to not close the show. We, we are having our show on October 23rd. Yeah, let, me, okay, let me explain. You guys have a concert coming up in Toronto at Lula Lounge. Um, if folks are in the greater Toronto area. It's more it's of a gathering. October 23rd. Well, uh, it's interesting because obviously we know that there are a lot of artists who are canceling shows and, you know, th- it, this is not the right time. It's inappropriate or something, whatever it is. You guys have decided to go ahead. Um, obviously, you know what's going on in the world, and you're, I know you're passionate about it. I saw you on the demonstration the other day. So tell me about why you decided to go ahead with the show. They want us silent. This is the thing that they want from us to be silent. For example, Darius at Bali's concert in London, you know? They want us to be silent. They, they, they. Uh, this is the. Have the, you heard about Darius? Yeah, this is they had to evacuate or something? What, what yeah, happened? Yeah, in the middle of the show. The, the the police came and and told Darius that you have to cancel the show. And later on, Darius was uh, explaining that like there is some uh, like um, I don't know spy or from the regime caused the, this problem wow. to ca- yeah. So I, yeah. So it's like if we if you if you're saying if you cancel shows, the regime wins. Exactly. Yeah. This is not the revolution of like being silenced. This time is not like be- being silence is working. This time shouting, this time being their voice is working. And we worked on some revolutionary songs as our moods today. Yeah. Because the other, th- I mean, the other thing some, some folks would say is it's not the time to go and celebrate and dance and have fun and whatever at a, uh, at a concert. Maybe that's partly why people um, cancel. But your, your, your repertoire, you've actually geared towards this moment is that uh, new songs and and old ones that seem to be applicable is that what you're doing yeah t- the set list is totally reflecting the situation hmm. yeah. how do you uh, I, I'm not I'm asking Shia less questions not because he's not eloquent but because I get to talk to him every week on the show but not yes. not you Taha um, or uh, how do you feel about this uprising in Iran this time? I mean, you were there until just three or four years ago. Do you, are you excited? Are you hopeful? Or does it break your heart to see what's going on? How would you describe things? 
all of them all all, all the titles all the topics you enumerate i feel all the things my heart is broken but my anger is more than the broken heart and uh, i can be silent that that's the uh, conclusion of the situation i should be active i should we should gather more we should have more gatherings like this event i cannot call it concert i call it a gathering we should gather more we should celebrate our unity and out of this unity we can change everything this time we have never been this united this is the first time we are feeling this unity you know you invited me to to the protest i'm accepting your invitation mm -hmm. and this is maybe the first time for you in all the eras that you are being this active in that protest no no it's not the first time for me no no it's, it's very much what i did for many years but but i but uh it's my first time getting to go with you uh, yeah, and, and, and inviting no, you and come I, with me i yeah. correct myself this is the first time you're inviting someone from iran <laughs> recently arrived to the process here well it was yeah. it was very nice to have you along with a bunch of us there on that um demonstration tell me about um the song you guys are going to play and also uh, different tribes different languages different like uh, ethnicity of persia they are united and did you stuff. notice that when we were walking there was a guy it happens to be a friend of mine who's an orthodox jew uh, jewish man did you see the guy who was walking next to me wow yeah yeah it's i mean there's the, the collection of people on that protested this um weekend was really really nice in, in toronto yeah but, uh, but i have to say like something uh, sad actually happened for I mean I, I have an aunt living in Vancouver and uh, she's religious and mm. as actually as a matter of fact she left Iran because she thought that Jomri Islami is ruining the religious oh, so and, she's a religious yeah, Iranian who doesn't support the regime oh yeah and, and she wears hijab and yes yeah, she wears uh -huh. hijab and she lives in Vancouver for like more than 20 years and um, so she went to the protest in Vancouver to support like uh, the um, protest against regime and uh, they sh the, some of the protesters shame her and like oh. ask her to leave the protest because of she, because she was a job which is I think w it's a lesson for democracy we have to accept that's really really troubling yeah so because she looked like a Muslim woman yes she was actually shamed at a protest that she yes. was attending to support the... Yes. You know. May I emphasize? Yeah. This is not a protest against Islam at all. This is a protest against Islamic governors that they are using Islam to manipulate people. That's it. That's your personal choice to be Muslim or Christian, any Buddhist, mm -hmm. no, atheist, anything. But uh, when you're using that tool to manipulate the crowd, that's wrong. And th this protest is against the mani manipulative version of an ideology, that's not true. against the roots of the ide ideology. Yeah. 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 Uh, there is a question that you keep asking the guests, like, is it a protest or revolution? Mm -hmm. I think it's renaissance, you know, it's renaissance. It's a renaissance. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's a delayed renaissance. Mm. What's the song that you guys have chosen to play? Yes, uh, this is very fresh, very new. New song? Yeah. You just wrote it? Yeah. Coming. About about the situation? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we are kind of improvising. Right <laughs> now and, uh, because it's very new and we are, we are yeah. Well, that's, the, that's exciting. Does it have a name? <laughs> um, no, but but uh, I will try to translate some sentences of the lyrics right now. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, this is the end of your story, and this is the end of your torture. Mm -hmm. uh, the women are the columns of our flags, and their hair would be the rope of your execution, of your hanging. We are tired from the dirt of your amamas and f 
to wash that dirt, we will wash the all land with our bloods. Wow. All right. Well, um, there's a new composition by Dang Show, somewhat improvisational with some very powerful lyrics. Thank you guys for being here. I'm gonna let you go walk over to the your your stations here. We've got a keyboard where Shia is walking over to right now. And sure. Taha By the way, I up. needed I needed this short time with you for the next time that we would have a longer interview because I was really stressed. You're my favorite voice in the world, and <laughs> I was really stressed to interview you in English because your voice is the best. And, yeah. Uh, yeah well, I'm a vocal artist. Yeah, yeah. I should have been ready for... <laughs> no, no, no. You're, first of all, you speak very very well in English, and it's uh, I can't wait for the longer interview. Yeah. That's really nice it's to It's kind of scary sitting here, I have <laughs> to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's about as easy as it's going to get. We'll make it scarier next time. I, I'm, I'm being a pussy with you here. Okay. Let's okay. Uh, dang show live in the Rook studio. Uh, grab your stuff, guys, and that's uh, playing a brand new composition um, sounds like it's addressed to the uh, the regime itself um, during this um, um, insurrectionary time in Iran. Um, take it away, guys. This is Dang Show live in the Rook Studio. Strip down, Dang Show. Taha and Shia. <laughs> قصت این بار آخر آزار تونه زن ستون پرچم ماست گیسوی زن دار تونه خسته از امامه چرک ما از این نکبت به دوریم تا از این چرک پاک باشیم و تنو با خون میشوریم خشم قطره در خروش است با من از دریا بگویید بس خواب شب ظلمت نور از فردا بجویید شک نکن ما قهرمانیم دختران نسل خونیم زندگی آزاد از ماست انقلاب نوجوانی قصت این بار آخر آزار تونه زن ستونه پرچم ماست گیسوی زن دار تونه خسته از امامه چرک ما از این نکبت بدوریم تا از این چرک پاک باشیم و تنو با خون میشوریم ما نشون دادیم که هستیم قزل طوفان میخونیم تا هزارون سال دیگه تا ابد ایران میمونیم ما نشون دادیم که هستیم دختران نسل نوریم صدای ما نبز لحظه است تا ابد شور و شعوری
Wesley Dunn, live in the Rook studio, the Dynamic Brothers, that's Shia and Taha Dang Show, performing a brand new piece that they've uh, written in tribute to, uh, well, in tribute to the, the protests in Iran, but I guess in answer to the regime as well. Um, and that was uh, Taha on lead vocals and saxophone, Shia on the piano. Thank you. It was beautiful. Thank you. I cannot talk right now. They're very emotional for you doing that, huh? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shia. Dang show live in the Rook studio. Of course, they're going to be back here for a proper full uh, episode um, sometime in the future, near future, hopefully. But in the meantime, you can see Dang show in Toronto at the Lula Lounge on October 23rd. Uh, the Gathering, as Taha puts it. Uh, go for The Gathering there. Um, check out Dang Show online for tickets. This is full time for this special episode of Rook, the Uprising. It's not a protest, it's a revolution. Uh, for all things Rook related, you can go to our website, rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com. You can also uh, find out how to support us there. Uh, we are not um, doing any sponsors or ads at this time, so if you like the content, you can help us. Uh, keep afloat nobody makes a penny from this uh go and press the support us button at the rook media website thanks to the amazing team who put this show together savvy roham talented anita super paris us mark pega behind Merthod and gluby shaya thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content please do subscribe if you've not done so already find me on instagram at gian gomeshi we will do another special edition of rook um, on Thursday, once again, hopefully with the voices from inside Iran, as we've been doing each Thursday. In the meantime, Mizun Washington.